The secret to everything. Hey, everybody! It's Dr. Kimberly ND CNH, and welcome to my new podcast, appropriately titled "Secret to Everything." Um, my intention is, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this because it's kind of boring. I want to get to the content for today. Uh, my intention is to bring you authentic keyword, um, high frequency, another keyword content um, that for the most part is something that will be beneficial um, to taking your time to watch whatever I'm putting forth. Uh, sometimes I like to do things I call drop into your field, which is designed to expand your field or to raise your frequency uh, by, you know, having you guys think about, um, you know, what's appropriate for you and what you believe and why you believe it. Um, so today I'm going to bring you a couple year old interview from Terry Lovelace. Terry to me is one of the, if not the, of course I'm having interference, most believable people in like UFO contact uh, as far as a solid long-standing UFO um, story and verifiable uh, information. Um, we can talk another time about the intent behind why this might have happened to him. And I don't know if we go into it because I haven't watched this whole thing and I will try to before I uh, put forth the second part so I can comment some more on it. Um, but this was a private session. This was not put out publicly. I know he's given this presentation many times publicly, but this was a private session done just for me and just for my group. Um, so it didn't have a big audience. In the second part, I may or may not release the questions of my class. We'll kind of see how we go, but I'm, we'll definitely release the second part. So, um, Terry Lovelace is an amazing, lovely man, very generous, and I hope you, if you haven't heard his story, I hope you um, really enjoy it. If you have heard his story, I hope you enjoy it again. So um, be sure to follow me on social media, secrettoeverything.com. If you want um, any kind of scans, classes, my monthly amazing group, which I have to thank because I can do things like this because I do have an amazing monthly community. Uh, that supports me so I can take my time and generously share um, everything with you guys. So again, I'm Kimberly McGeorge, and I look forward to hanging out with you for the next year on what I consider one of the most amazing podcasts out there. So enjoy Terry's presentation. So, um, I was going to give a brief bio, but I actually think I'm just going to um, allow you to uh, run your presentation and introduce yourself. Um, I kind of said a couple of words about you before I brought you on. Um, I know we're being recorded. I think I've got control of the slides, so um, I'll just bring up your picture and I'll get off and let you take it from here if that's okay. Perfect. Works for me. How many students do you have tonight? Um, let me see. Looks like we have about 17. Wonderful. That's good. Yeah, good now. Okay, whenever you're ready, Terry, you can go ahead. Okay, I'm ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Lovelace. Uh, coming to you from Dallas, Texas, where it's very hot right now. Um, I'd like to talk to you tonight about my abduction and the abduction of other people who shared their experiences with me. Uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. I graduated from high school in 1973 and I joined the United States Air Force uh, and spent the next six years on active duty. I spent my entire enlistment at Whiteman Air Force Base in Western Missouri uh, it was a SAC base uh, with uh, B-52s with nuclear weapons and uh, a squadron of the Minutemen II ICBM missiles aimed at Russia or the Soviet Union then. Um, after completing military service, I 
finished a degree in psychology uh, and a law degree from Western Michigan and practiced law, first in private practice. Then I was appointed as an assistant attorney general for the United States Territory of American Samoa, about 2,500 miles south of Hawaii, the only US territory south of the equator and a very cool place to be. Uh, very nice people, very big people, very big hearts, nice people. Uh, from there, I went to the state of Vermont where I was state's attorney for, uh, well, until 2012 when I retired and uh, moved to Dallas, Texas. So with that being said, uh, I'll tell you about 1977. While I was on active duty, um, a friend of mine named Toby and I decided we were going to take a camping trip to Devil's Den State Park in the northwest corner of Arkansas. And we didn't know it at the time, but Devil's Den actually has a really long and kind of uh, tragic and uh, kind of spooky past. Um, yeah, let me tell you about that just briefly. Uh, when I was researching my book and writing it in 2017, I uh, found out, as did David Polites, who wrote the Missing 411 book series, that I couldn't get information about people killed or missing through Arkansas state parks or federal parks uh, without a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, and, and that the common answer was, we don't keep those records. That's hard to believe. But I found by doing a newspaper search, an article from the Pittsburgh Press from 1946 uh, about a little girl named Catherine Van Alst, who was seven years old. And uh, she and her parents and her two younger brothers went on a camping trip uh, from Pittsburgh. They were gonna stay a couple nights at Devil's Den State Park and then continue on to El Paso where they had relatives. So they're in Devil's Den State Park. They're spending their first night there. They wake up the next morning early and you know, mama's putting breakfast on the table and the kids are chasing one another around the camper as kids will do. And the two boys pop out and there's no Catherine. And the mom asks the boys, where's your sister? And the boys are like, well, she was right here. And mother's annoyed but says, go find them. So they scamper off to go find her, their sister and they come back 10 minutes later and they say, but we don't find her. So that gets the, uh, that gets dad involved and he gets some of the fellow campers at the campsite involved. Uh, and by about 10 o'clock, uh, they got park rangers involved uh, who took matter very seriously. Uh, she was, um, the campground, the area surrounding the campground has a lot of rocks and dense foliage. And she was wearing flip-flops and a swimsuit. So, you know, she couldn't have gone very far, right? And they start a search. And the, stir the search was to last seven days. At the end of the seventh day, it would switch to a recovery effort. And everyone was confident they'd find her, you know, in a matter of hours. And that, that didn't happen. And they had 2,500 volunteers. Uh, they had the Little Rock Civil Air Patrol, the National Guard. Uh, and they had a bunch of volunteers from Arkansas State University, uh, somewhere in the area. And uh, on the se seventh day, the morning of the seventh day, there was a young man from Arkansas State University named Porter Chadwick. Uh, and I tried to find him and I could not find him. Um, and Porter Chadwick was about, depending on who you were, the sources differ. It's either eight miles away from the campsite or 13 miles away from the campsite. So I'll just assume it was the, la the, you know, the lesser. Um, so he's searching an area that's uh, eight miles from the uh, campsite at an elevation of over 600 feet above the campsite and accessible through a zigzag trail that goes up the side of this limestone bluff. And he goes up, the, the, the top of this place has been searched twice before. He goes up to the top of it and he's calling out Catherine and little girl pops up. 
boom, from underneath this uh, limestone overhang. And she says, here I am. And the guy breaks down, he's emotional and says, my God, where have you been? Are you okay? And she says, yeah. And he says, well, what happened to you? How did you get here? And she said, well, I woke up here this morning. That's all I remember. And I thought I'd just wait here till you come and got me. So he carried her back to the campsite. What's really interesting is there was no potable water up there anywhere, nothing to drink. And she wasn't dehydrated. She hadn't lost an ounce of weight. She was fully hydrated, um, but she had no memory of what happened to her. And uh, she was checked out by a doctor. And aside from a few bug bites, she was fine. And that's just a pretty weird tale. Um, and uh, I found that in the Kansas City Star and in the Pittsburgh Press. Uh, I would love to have found Catherine Van Alst. I don't know how old she would have been or if she'd even been alive, but uh, you know, that's an opportunity lost. That would, have been, that would have been a great person to talk to. And the second uh, I wanna tell you about is in 2017, I, I subscribed to a couple local newspapers down there around Devil's Den State Park, just to kind of keep an eye on what's going on in the park. And in March of, of 2017, there was a 28 year old woman named Monica Murphy who was uh, missing. And a week later they found her in the park and she was at the base of a hundred foot bluff and it was ruled a suicide. Um, but 28 year old mother with, with uh, three children at home, I mean, no matter what the circumstances, it's tragic, but it's just uh, Devilston State Park has a lot of really creepy stuff going on. And uh, the second incident that happened in 2017 was a 32 year old young man from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, who came down to walk through Devilston State Park with his friend. And they drove, made the drive down from Oklahoma and parked in the parking lot and they started walking what's called the Butterfield Trail. And the Butterfield Trail is named after the Butterfield uh, stagecoach line, which was the first intercontinental stagecoach line or, or the first one that spanned, you know, the entire country. Uh, and it's now a paved uh, trail and it's a very easy trail to walk, I'm told. And it has, um, you know, rails and stuff on either side and a paved walkway and then it's dense forest right outside right outside the, the walkway and Rodney Letterman and his friend are walking on this trail and Rodney realizes he's having an asthma attack and he's like man I left I left my uh, inhaler back in the car and he asked his friend would you run back and, and grab it for me and his friend's like sure no worries man no worries and his friend runs back to the truck and grabs the medication and comes back. He's back in 25 minutes or so. And uh, there's no Rodney Letterman. And he's certain this was the place where he left him. And then he finds Rodney's phone is on, is on the trail, right, right at his feet. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, I don't, my phone's either in my hand or in my pocket. I'd never set it down on a trail. And this guy is in the middle of an asthma attack. I doubt if he's going to feel like walking off the trail and getting into that, uh, the heavy brush and the rocks and all that stuff. So um, his friend's concerned and he notifies the park rangers uh, who take it very seriously. And they started a search. And there is a federal park just across the, the roadway that cuts the two parks in half. I forget the name of the roadway, but uh, they got a bunch of uh, federal park rangers over to help out the guys in the state park. Devil's Den is an Arkansas state park. And um, they eventually expanded it. And just like with little Catherine Van Alls, they had 2,500 volunteers. Only this time they had helicopters with FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, looking for a heat signature of the guy. Um, and they, they searched that park. Uh, well, the official search lasted a week. Uh, and afterwards, the um, Letterman family funded their own search, <clears throat> pardon me, funded their own search uh, that lasted through late October. And they never found anything of the guy. 
that is until uh, until March of 2019, there's a young couple walking down the Butterfield Trail. And the uh, young lady says to her friend, is that an albino turtle? <clears throat> Pardon me. And her friend's like, you know, what are you talking about? And to the left of the trail, there's this log, like eight foot long, large log. That's part of the, uh, you know, kind of the guard they put up to define where the trail is and where you should walk and where you shouldn't. Uh, and sitting right dead center on this log is this um, football shaped white object. Uh, and they walk over to look at it and the young man picks it up and uh, recognize it as, recognizes it as being bone. And uh, they were concerned enough, they notified the park rangers who came down and, and treated it as a crime scene. They did a, a forensic uh, protocol, followed a forensic protocol. You know, they bagged the, uh, the bone in, in the evidence bag, forwarded it to the Bartlesville, Oklahoma medical examiner who a week later uh, certified as being the top of Rodney Letterman's skull. And that is all they ever found of Rodney Letterman. They never found a stitch of clothing, shoes, nothing. That's it. So a lot of strange stuff goes on at Devil's Den State Park. In 1977, when, I, when Rodney and I went down, we, uh, we had never been camping before. You know, I was a city kid. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. He was from Flint, Michigan. I knew he hadn't been camping before. Um, but we really felt compelled to make this trip. So we did. And I had a new camera I wanted to try out. Uh, I was kind of an amateur photographer. And my friend Rodney was um, an amateur astronomer and just really, really into watching the night sky. So the purpose of the exercise was I was going to go down there in hope of photographing some wildlife and he was going to see about uh, what we're going to see about. He was going to watch the night sky without light pollution. So to get a campsite with no light pollution, you can't stay at the campground because you're going to have people to the right of you, people to the left of you, and it's just not going to work. So we decided that we would uh, find our own campground. So what we did was we dodged the ranger station. We did not buy a camping permit. And we, uh, we took the uh, road away from the, it went, the roadway went kind of uh, west and maybe a little north. And it, uh, it wound around and uh, we came to this chain across the road with this really sternly worded, keep out, do not enter, no honey, no camping, no fishing, et cetera. And we thought it was like a nature preserve or something. And actually we found out later that it's not even in Devilston State Park. That's a federal land owned by the Bureau of Land Management and leased to a private individual. So there's a picture of Devilston State Park. It's image 11. And if you look at image 11, if we can pull that up, you can see that it's surrounded by forest. Um, that's a creek on the northeast corner there that trails off. Um, we were there in 1977 and it looked absolutely identical. It looked exactly the same. I didn't even bother looking at Google Earth because I was sure this place should have been covered with 40 year old mature trees by now and it's not. There is, there are, uh, if you go to Google Earth and you pull it up, it's easy to find because from the aerial photograph, you can see it's almost a, a triangular shaped area. And it is clear cut to this day. Uh, there's a, a dirt roadway that goes up. That's what we drove up. That's what I drove up. Um, and we set up our little campsite um, at about the, uh, well, if you made that into a clock, it'd be about at one o'clock. We were on the edge of the tree line. When we were there, I don't know what time of year this is, but when we were there, uh, the trees, the tops of the trees was just about level to most of the, of the I, call it a, I call it a meadow. 
back in the day because it was just uh well, it was just really nice it was you know knee-high grass or less and late blooming wildflowers and it was just just nice and we set up a little campsite again off by the uh by the tree line and you know we did we did all the fun stuff you do when you camp and uh, you know had a campfire and and roasted hot dogs and you know it was fun for us because it was all new stuff to us stuff we hadn't done before so uh it's on about nine o'clock in the evening and we're we're on these air mattresses we got the tent set up in back of us and we got a campfire between us and this sounds a little cliche or a little bit like out of the movies but uh, when we discuss the commonalities among people that have had this kind of experience, you'll see that um, this, is, this is pretty common. It really is. Uh, what happened was uh, there was just an abrupt silence. Just a few minutes earlier, we had had trouble carrying our voices across the campfire because the crickets, the tree frogs, you know, all the bugs in the forest that make noise were just loud. So we're, um, we're carrying on our conversation. And then I noticed that it was dead silent. And I asked my friend, you know, like he's going to know, but I asked him anyway. Um, it got awful quiet out here. Is that normal? And he's like, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, don't worry about the bugs. They'll be back. And uh, so he wasn't he wasn't too upset about it, but I was unnerved, I got to tell you. Uh, so we carried on with conversation. And a few minutes after this, <clears throat> he has his head turned to his left, which would have been toward the west. And he's fixated looking at something. And he asked me, he says, hey, Terry, were those lights there before? And I'm looking and I can't see anything. Uh, I knew this, that there was nothing around us. I mean, it's built up somewhat now. There are some houses around and, you know, I'm sure at night you could see lights in the distance, but when we were there, there was nothing. And uh, I couldn't see them. His torso was in the way. I, I, I stood up and I took a step back and on the Western horizon, just above the Western horizon, there were these, this, this little triangle uh, configuration of three bright stars and they were too far above the horizon to have been lights from a from a parking lot or a train or something uh, so they were definitely in the sky and uh, I asked my friend you know hey you're the you're the amateur astronomer here man are, are, are those um, are those naturally occurring objects in the sky what are those and he said, I don't know. I don't know of anything. Now, this is a guy that could name all the constellations and, I mean, you know, tell you when the satellite was going to come over. I mean, he was just, uh, that was going to be his life's work. And uh, he said, I don't think those belong there. I'm like, okay. So this is like cliche number two. Um, but again, it is a commonality among people that have had this situation. Um, and it's very common in the near-death experience community. Um, after my, my first book uh, was out in March of 2018, I had people from the NDE community contact me. I don't know how, I, how we managed to cross paths, but we did. And uh, we, discussed, we discussed commonalities, and, and this was one of them. And that was that as soon as these three lights, what they did was, they, they were static, they didn't move for minutes and we're discussing what they could be. And then they rotated like they were on an axis and they turned about 120 degrees and it oriented itself with the apex, the point of the triangle headed up and the base uh, parallel with the horizon. And as soon as it turned and locked into that position, it started to go up and it went up into the night sky. And it maintained that orientation where we could see just, you know, the three lights. 
and it reached the ceiling. I don't know how high, you know, maybe 10,000 feet. I'm guessing at that, I had nothing to, to reference it to, but it, it reached a, 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 what I call a ceiling, it stopped. And then it changed its orientation and kind of went this way with the apex of the triangle pointed in our direction because now instead of seeing the three lights, it turned uh, in our direction and we could see three. So the point of the triangle was pointed in our direction. And then it started a glide plane down toward us. And that's when I felt um, where I had been unnerved just you know, a few minutes earlier, uh, I suddenly felt this um, wave of uh, calm wash over me. And I'm sure my friend is in the, in the kind of in the same situation, but uh, I had no fear at all. That unnerved feeling that I had earlier uh, was completely gone. And I just felt um, semi-sedated and almost, um, almost somehow kind of removed from the situation, diso disassociated in some way. Like I was an observer more than a participant in what was going on. It was a strange place. Uh, and there, there's no conversation between the two of us. We just watch this thing as it glides in and it comes to a halt about 3000 feet over the meadow. And we're just offset to the side. And uh, we're looking at this thing and uh, while we're watching it, from underneath, dead center underneath of this thing, and it's a perfect triangle, and the points of each triangle are lit. There are lights on, the, on it. And um, it shot down this uh, beam of light from this underneath in the center of the thing. It shot down this beam of light about six inches in diameter, and it was a bright, visible white light. It was, it was the same effect you get if you, like a high power searchlight that cuts through fog, you see a column of white light. That's what this looked like, you know, but of course there was no fog. Uh, and this was just about six inches in diameter and it was very bright and white and it landed right in, the, right in square in the middle of our campfire and stayed there for maybe a minute. And then it just clicks off like someone hits a switch. And then there came this uh, laser-like light now, lasers were kind of new in 1977. I'd seen them on TV, but I'd never seen one in real life. And this laser light comes down and it kind of dances all over our campsite. And it struck everything. It struck us. It struck me in the chest several times. I never felt a thing. I know it struck my friend. Uh, it struck my car, the tent, uh, Toby's backpack. Um, it struck all the stuff that we brought with us. And I had the feeling, you know, this thing's checking us out. And uh, I mean, that sounds kind of obvious, but I think that's what it was doing. It really was scanning us or something. And that lasted for about three minutes and then that shut off. Um, and next, um, that sedated feeling that I'd felt transitioned from sedation to sleepy. And they're two really two separate things. They're, they're, not, they're not the same. They're distinct, dis distinctly not the same thing. I mean, I was, I was uh, relaxed, semi-sedated, and then suddenly all I wanted to do was lay my head down and go to sleep. I could easily have went to sleep right there on the, on the air mattress, but I didn't. I felt compelled to pick up my air mattress and go into the tent for some reason. And that's what my friend did. And I didn't bother to take my shirt off. My, I was wearing my combat boots. I left them on, they were laced up. And uh, he threw his air mattress in and just kind of fell on top of it and passed out. And I followed suit, I threw mine in and fell on top of mine and passed out. And I was unconscious. I don't think I slept at all. I think I was unconscious. And uh, the next thing that I remember was waking up to these crazy flashing lights that were coming through the canvas of the tent. 
and just lighting up the tent like insane, you know, like like a uh, like an old time flashbulb, camera flashbulb, you know, that bright, really intense, of course, for a millisecond. And uh, so this this light is white, yellow, and kind of an orange in color. Where before the lights we'd seen were just white. And I couldn't understand the intensity of this thing. And I wake up and I'm trying to make sense of it. I really don't have my wits about me yet. And I'm thinking, well, these must be, you know, like the overhead flashing lights of a park ranger's truck or something. Um, and I sat up and I looked down at my feet and in one of these flashes of light, uh, my boots had been unlaced almost all the way down. And that didn't scare me. Um, you know, I, I really thought the park rangers were there just to throw us out, you know, no big deal, wasn't the crime of the century. Um, but that elevated my concern. You know, if I had to rate my fear, my fear on a one to 10 scale, I was probably at a two. And I, uh, I didn't understand how my boots got that way because I was certain I went to bed with them fully laced up. I wouldn't have gone to bed with them like that. I'd taken them off or I'd uh, left them laced and, and on my feet, but I wouldn't have done that. So I take off my boots and uh, my socks are on sideways. And it doesn't occur to me that we'd been undressed and redressed. That does, hasn't hit home yet. And I take my socks and boots off, put them back on properly, lace them up. And in the flashes of light, I can see my friend is to my left. And uh, in one of the flashes of bright white light, I could see that he'd been crying. He's on his knees and he's peeking out through the flap on his side of the tent. And I guess the saline in his tears fluoresced because I could see this, this white streak down the side of his face. And um, that concerned me. I really wasn't scared. And I asked him, I said, hey, Toby, what are you looking at? What's out there? Is it park rangers? And he didn't give me a straight answer. And I I was on my knees. I kind of walked on my knees over a foot or two and pulled back the flap of my tent or on the side of my tent. And it was a two-man tent. He was on the left, I was on the right from the inside. And I look out into this meadow and I saw two things. And that was that this triangular shaped thing that had been, you know, 3000 feet over our heads when we went to bed had descended. And it's now just about 30 feet over the floor of this meadow. And this thing was enormous. You know, I, I neglected to send a photo. Uh, I don't have a photograph, God, I wish I did. Um, but I have a drawing that I made contemporaneously, contemporaneous with the event um, that I drew back in 1977. And that can be, if you want to see that, uh, you can go to terrylovelace.com and the drawing is on there along with the x-rays that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, yeah, number seven is a picture of me in the Air Force back, the, back in the day. Um, so, um, yeah, I saw that this craft, this humongous triangular shaped craft had descended and now just, just 30 feet over the floor of the meadow. I'm grateful that we had camp off on the side and instead of in the middle of this meadow and had this thing hanging over us. And the second thing that I saw in the flashes of light was about a dozen, maybe 15 of what I took to be children, kids. And I didn't get that. And I'm like, Toby, man, what are these kids doing out here in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere? And that's when he said, Terry, man, look at them again. They're not little kids. Um, and don't you remember they took us and they hurt us? And as soon as he said that, I had imagery. I had images. Uh, understand, I've never had a clear linear memory of what happened to us that night, but I have bits and pieces. And... Um, my fear level went to probably a five and uh, maybe higher, maybe a 10. <laughs> and um, 
Now we're both terrified. Now we're thinking, I, I, I'm concerned we're going to sneeze or cough or do something and draw their attention. They're going to come over and check us out. You know, we had no way of knowing that, you know, they were long done with us. And uh, we watched them for a while. I don't know how long. Both of our watches had stopped. We had wind up mechanical watches, which were kind of the standard of the day. Um, we were both EMTs. We worked in the emergency room together. And uh, we needed nice watches really for the job uh, to be an EMT. And my watch had stopped at 240s. Toby's stopped at 241. My watch never worked again. I threw it away. I wish I'd kept it. And while we're watching, um, terrified, another light pops on from underneath this thing. And this is about a 30 foot column of white light. It has that visible white light quality to it that that beam had that I described as like a searchlight cutting through fog. And it's just turned on right dead center of this thing and underneath. And it's a column of light that's it's as wide as this thing is off the metal. And I think it was about 30 feet off the metal and it was about 30 foot in width. And as soon as this thing kicked on, these little guys all turned their attention to this thing. And in the flashes of light, I could see that they were not human beings, that their heads were disproportionately large to their bodies. Their limbs were spindly. Uh, they had very thin, long torsos. Um, and they walked with a weird gait. They walked with this distinctive gait, uh, which I don't know how to describe other than like, almost like they had sore feet or something. And they walk with a limp like. And uh, while we're watching, the uh, first two little guys stepped into this light. Of course, we could see them real well because they were well lit once they stepped into the light. And they stayed there for maybe 20 seconds and they pixelated out and they just disappeared and they were gone. And it was, um, that was frightening. And in twos and threes, these little guys stepped into this light um, and would pixelate out over the span of about 20 seconds. And it looked very much like the 1960s Star Trek uh, thing where they had a, and I'm not a science fiction fan, but they had the, uh, and I forget what they call it. You know, the thing they would stand on and be uh, teleported somewhere else. Uh, that's what it looked like, where the, where the characters would like pixelate out on your, te on your television set. So after the last two little guys pixelated out, a minute or a second or two later, and the, the light just shut off. And then it, something changed. The, um, points of light that had been flashing now went to just a steady white light and um, it took off. And it didn't take off like a rocket ship, it just lifted off like a hot air balloon and it went straight up. And we watched it until it was three points of light, till it was one point of light and then it was gone. And we were afraid of course, we had no idea what time it was. In retrospect, we figured out that it was about an hour before daylight, but an hour before dawn. And I told my friend, look, I, I'm staying in this tent until it's daylight outside. And my friend's like, no, 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 let's go now. And we debated that uh, for about 40 minutes. And uh, I finally caved and said, okay, let's, let's, let's go now. You know, I, I didn't want to leave the tent because all I had over my head was a piece of canvas, but I felt like it gave me cover. You know, I felt like I was hid and safe. And in that, you know, 60 foot dash to the car, uh, I'm going to be exposed. I'm going to be vulnerable. And, you know, to this day, I will not cut across an open field, especially if I'm by myself. I, I will walk a mile and a half around if I have to, but I won't cut across open ground. Um, I guess that's like PTSD like stuff, but, you know, that's one of a few symptoms that I have uh, from my, this adventure. So 
we made it to our car and uh, to my car and uh, we're back to base. So there's a lot more to the story, but not any more than I have time to go into tonight because um, we got a lot of things to cover. Uh, I don't know uh, if you guys, if you guys, I can't see uh, you. Uh, is there anybody there who has any questions about my experience that night? What happened? If you are, can you mute your, uh, unmute your um, uh, microphone and speak up? Anybody? Okay. Hi, this is Karen, and um, I was wondering if you feel like, since you had that experience, do you ever feel that you are still being targeted or, um, um, you know, being observed, um, you know, by them? That's a very good question, and uh, I thank you for asking it because it uh, it reminds me uh, that I was going to get into that. I had, I had. Um, episodes when, when I was a child. Um, I have two books, Incident at Devil's Den and Devil's Den, The Reckoning. Um, they're both on Amazon and they both in the beginning uh, talk about experiences that I had as a child. And one of the commonalities that we're going to talk about and uh, well, I should explain, you know, how did I accumulate this data? Because I think that's important. Um, I put an email address in the back of my first book and I said, look, I'm not a doctor or a therapist, but if you've had the experience and you'd like to share it, I'd love to hear from you. So I've had now almost 1700 responses from people. Um, I've had a, a, of those probably 1200, maybe 1100 or people sharing experiences that they've had. And the experiences uh, run the gamut from, you know, just seeing a silver disc dart across the sky, uh, all the way up to being abducted and losing a fetus. So it runs the entire gamut. But I had a lot of people, a lot of people write to me. And uh, I had a set of questions that I'd ask them. And one of the questions that I asked them was about, uh, you know, is your sleep disturbed? You have nightmares? Do you have, uh, are you, do you have dreams? Uh, and because I had a lot of childhood experiences, I also asked them, did you have these dreams in childhood? And I had a bunch of people write to me, a lot of people and say, you know, this is kind of off topic, I know, but you know, I had this weird dream when I was five or six years old, or four years old. And that dream in my mind's eye is as crystal clear today as it was back when I was a little kid. And every time someone would tell me about that, I'd follow up with three questions. What I tried to do is I tried to somewhat vet these people. And you know, it's not up to me to decide who's credible and who's not, uh, or gauge the veracity of anyone's story. But um, I managed to phone call to a lot of these people and uh, especially the ones that had this uh, phenomena of uh, the crazy dream that they remember from childhood, you know, whether they're, you know, 20 or 60. And uh, for those that they claim that they did, I asked them, you know, can you tell me what you got for Christmas that year? Can you tell me uh, where you went on, on vacation with your family? And you, can you tell me the names of three people that attended your birthday party that, that were not relatives? Um, or two or one or whatever you can remember. And uh, a lot of these folks couldn't answer any of those questions, but they could remember the stupid dream they had when they were six, you know? And that just kind of puzzled me. Uh, I'd like to know more about how that works. And, you know, so what I did was these people wrote to me and shared their experiences. And I'm kind of a data guy, I like stuff on spreadsheets. And I started putting all of their experiences out on spreadsheets. And um, that's when I was able to identify these commonalities. Now, I, I have a friend, um, his name is Les Velez, V-E-L-E-Z. And Les um, 
since 1996 has been involved with uh, an organization called uh, OPUS, O-P-U-S. That's for the uh, Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support. And you can find them at opusnetwork.org. They're a nonprofit uh, organization out of uh, California in good standing. And uh, they do a lot of nice things for people, uh, people that have had experiences and are in crisis in particular. Uh, most of what they do, 90% of what they do is um, UFO abduction related uh, support for people. They have an online support system and like a little community of people. Um, the other 10% being people that have had experiences with ghosts and, and uh, Bigfoot or, or whatever and are just having trouble processing it. So uh, Les has been collecting this data. I'd only been collecting it for three years. Uh, but Les has been involved in this business uh, since 1996. And um, he has an incredible amount of material. And I only had a very small sample, but my sample related really well to what he had. And we started comparing these commonalities in our data and they were very well, uh, or they matched, they matched, they matched very well. And then there is a, um, a woman named Melinda Leslie, who's also an abductee and an experiencer who speaks all over the country and uh, lives in Sedona has a business in Sedona where she'll take you out into the uh, desert with uh, night vision goggles and go out and show you the vortex places. And, you know, about half the time or better, they uh, go out and they see crazy stuff in the sky. So I've never been on her tour, but I'd like to go. But Melinda has been in this UFO culture, I'd call it, for 30 years. And she's assembled a lot of data. And the three of us sat down and compared all these things. And uh, they really are common to a lot of people. So I'll, I'll get into them in, in just a bit. Uh, I did, before we get into, I do want to add a disclaimer. And that is that, you know, if, if you have one of these, um, one of these commonalities, if you have a dozen of these commonalities, that's not proof of anything. Uh, it's suggestive of the fact that you have experiences in common with other people who believe that they've been abducted. So, you know, don't, don't freak out or read too much into it, but take note of it because um, when I sat down for myself and I put put these categories in order, I could say, yep, check that one. Oh yeah, that one. Oh yeah, more like that one. So, you know, you may find, um, I don't know if any of you are experiencers or if any of you are abductees. Um, if you are, let me know, let me know. I, won't, I won't interrogate you, but uh, uh, I'd just be curious what you saw, if anything. Does anybody have any memories Anybody have any nightmares? Well, maybe you will tonight. We'll see. Okay. Uh, I took these stories that I got and I took 30 of the very best of the best, the stories that I thought were the best. And I put them in the back of the second book uh, called The Reckoning. And there are 30 case files back there uh, where I share stories from other people. And I'm going to share four of them right now. And that'll kind of just get us geared up for uh, talking about these commonalities. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I kind of like to do this on an interactive like basis. So uh, I really would appreciate uh, questions and dive in at any time or, you know, say you're crazy or whatever you want to say, right. but this please feel Dr. free to participate. I have a question for you. Um, why, and I was wondering this the whole time, I'm not done with your first book, but I'm quite a ways through it. I was wondering the whole time because I know I've had at least two abduction experiences, 
But what makes the difference between you who were so lucid, in my opinion, and you were allowed to see so much because even though I have proof, which I don't want to talk about right now, but I have proof that I was abducted, but I don't have the memory, which is really weird to proof you're abducted, but you don't have any memory like you have. Like I didn't see anything. I still to this day only have the missing, only have a couple of things that you're probably going to talk about, like missing time, stop, you know, um, you know, things in my car that didn't work, you know, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of normal stuff. But um, so why are you so lucid? Why were both of you? It wasn't even just you that were lucid. Like you were both allowed to see like the wrap up, like the leaving, like, do you know what I mean? They didn't wipe you. I'm so, because, and I, I don't know if you know this, but I mean, I've been in the paranormal since I was born. I investigate Bigfoot dog and I've had UFO. I mean, I've had the gamut and yeah, I've never been allowed to um, have that. And I don't think a lot of people, I mean, maybe, you know, the people cause you're in the community and I'm not exactly in the UFO community, but that just blows my mind because I know they have the technology, not just the military, of course, and the corporations, but also I know a lot of races have the memory wiping technology. So it just blows my mind. It's almost like they wanted you guys to see. Well, and understand when I walked away from, when I walked away from this, uh, I came out of this with my own trauma. I mean, I, I don't want to understate the struggles that I had uh, coming out of this experience because it was very difficult for me to process. Uh, it was very traumatic. I, I left it with some PTSD diagnosed. Um, and um, I had a lot of trouble with sleep over the years. I still sleep with a light on. So, and as I said, I, I never had a clear linear memory of what happened to us. I do have some memories of being inside the ship, uh, but they're just flashes of memory. And um, that's what I have. Uh, over the years, I've had uh, nightmares um, that I think are snippets of what I experienced. I can't be sure, but that's what I think. Um, and then in 2012, um, I did my best to not dwell on this. I, I discussed it with, I was married then, uh, still am. I discussed it with my wife and uh, no one else. And I knew that my career path was going to be the law. That's what I, that was my plan since I was nine. And uh, I knew that it would be wise not to talk about it. I was also afraid of the, um, of the Air Force. Um, they were not happy with me. Uh, and I, there, there's a long story behind that. Uh, then it involved the Office of Special Investigation and uh, they actually did some, they gave me uh, sodium pentatol, or pardon me, sodium amatol, which is a short acting hypnotic. Uh, and they did hypnotic regression. The OSI did this, the Office of Special Investigations in the Air Force. So, hey, wasn't that a wonderful um, beginning of his talk, like I told you? So, I found out a lot through scanning thousands of people's energy fields, whether they asked me about um, abductions or not, or contact or not. So I'll be sharing that on part three or four. I'm not sure how long this will take, but we're going to stick with it as long as it takes. So thank you for watching today. Please like and subscribe on my channels and on Conscious Awakening Network. Again, um, I appreciate you being here and I look forward to seeing you next time. There's much more juicier stuff to come. So thanks for watching.